Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Love Rising podcast. We are so excited to have our guest, Greg McEwen, on today. Um, and I'm just going to read his bio because it really speaks to who we're talking to and, and all the awesome things that he's done. So he's originally from London, England, um, and is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less, and the founder of McEwen Incorporated, a company with a mission to teach essentialism to millions of people around the world. Their clients include Adobe, Apple, Airbnb, Cisco, Google, Facebook, Pixar, Salesforce, and more like that, Yahoo. Um, McEwen is an accomplished public speaker and has spoken to hundreds of audiences around the world, including in Australia, Bulgaria, Canada, China, England, Holland, India, Italy, Norway, Singapore, South Africa, and the United States. Enough, States. isn't it? It's enough. <laughs> Nobody wants to buy on this long. This is, it's, 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 we need to essentialize the bio. That's what yeah. I see. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I, I actually asked for a shorter one, but then I read it and I was like, you know, I could just read this because it's really impressive. <laughs> but we can, yeah, we can, we'll cut it out there and we'll just say, you know, he is, he is accomplished, very accomplished. Lots of lots of um, accolades and all of these things. So, Greg, welcome. Um, I was just telling Greg before we got on that I have read his book Essentialism four times at least and gone back to it. Um, and because it's it's so good, but it, of course it's the disciplined pursuit of less. So it requires discipline, which again can be difficult, which I'm sure we'll get into. So um, so excited to have you on. Please share your story, not the bio story, but your story. Like, how did you start to talk about this? And how did you become, I would say, an expert on this subject of simplification? I appreciate uh, being on and uh, I appreciate everybody tuning in. I, you know, I, um, I remember a few years ago uh, in the middle of working with um, uh, companies trying to understand what helps them break through to the next level, what helps them find their highest point of contribution, and what keeps them back from doing that. That uh, I got an email from my uh, colleague at the time said Friday would be a very bad time for your wife to have a baby uh, because uh, you know I want you to be at this meeting between one and two, and, and, and you know I'm sure they were joking at least s somewhat, but somehow as we're in the hospital Thursday night and Friday comes along. Uh, Friday morning, the, 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 my daughter was born you know, in the middle of the night, so we're there Friday morning. Everybody's, everybody's well enough off, but, you know, I'm feeling torn. And to my shame, I go to the meeting. And, um, and really, I took away from that, that error. You know, I mean, everybody knows I made a fool's bargain in doing that. But took away the simplest of lessons, which is if you don't prioritize your life, someone else will. And so uh, as I went on to research that subject more, more deeply, the subject of prioritization, why we prioritize, why, you know, how we do, why we sometimes let non-essential things uh, take over essential things, I, I found that I am anything but alone in this. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, people, people watching or listening to this can ask themselves a few questions to have a sense of how they're doing. You know, maybe they didn't pull a McEwen, but you know, have 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 they ever found themselves um, as I was feeling stretched too thin at work or at home? Uh, have, have they ever found themselves uh, being like I was being busy but not necessarily productive? Have they ever found themselves where they feel like their day is being hijacked by other people's agenda for them? And if they answered yes to any of those questions, what, what you know, I would put to everybody is that the, 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 the day as I was falling into what Jim Collins has called the undisciplined pursuit of more, where you sort of reactively uh, saying yes to things without really thinking about it. And, uh, and, and so it gets us into a pattern. And the pattern, to give it a name, I gave it a name, is non-essentialism. And what, what the book is about, uh, the book Essentialism, is the antidote to that problem. So if the problem is the undisciplined pursuit of more, non-essentialism, then uh, I came up with the term essentialism to describe the, the way out, uh, the way of the essentialist. 
And that's the disciplined pursuit of less. The disciplined pursuit of less, but better. So there's really three parts to it. You have to figure out what's essential. You have to eliminate what's non-essential. And you have to create a system that makes execution as easy as it can be. That's the overview. Mm. Yeah, really good. Good overview, simple. Um, I guess, and this could maybe be something that we extrapolate on, but what, why are so many people under this kind of guise of the undisciplined pursuit of more? Like what is, what? because that is the default, I would say, for most people. Uh, yes, it, it, it definitely is. And, and I, for the longest time, including as I was writing the book, framed it the way you just framed it. I've, and, and I'll answer it that way because that's the way you asked it. But then I want to frame it differently because I've thought about it differently since. That, you know, answering your question, why, why? Well, we've been through this tremendous change in, you know, societal expectations over a long period of time. Let's just go through quickly, but I think interestingly, sort of three eras of non-essentialism. So the first era, uh, as I, to my reading anyway, um, well, the change happened after the 1400s. Let me explain how. So in the 1400s, the word priority came into the English language and it was singular. You know, the very first thing, the, the priorist thing. And it, it had to be singular. Of course, it had to be. It's the most important, the very first thing. And for the next 500 years, according to Drucker, it stayed singular. So only in response to the Industrial Revolution did somebody sitting around in some meetings say, look, I know, this, I know the answer to the problem of how many things we now have and how overloaded everybody is. And, and the answer is to have uh, you know, priorities, uh, many very first or priorist things. And uh, I mean, it, you know, but can you have very, very many very first before all other things things? It's, it's a sort of nonsense. So that's phase one it is that as we had the Industrial Revolution, we threw out a whole series of things of, that make humans thrive, that make humans human. And, and that's not to say everything was bad in the Industrial Revolution. Clearly it wasn't. But it shifted certain things that were very beneficial to the way that people actually work, live, love, and, uh, and, and as I say, thrive. So that's, that's era one. Era two is after the Industrial Revolution is now happening, we have the Second World War, most discombobulating experience you know, humanity can almost imagine uh, for, the, for the developed world at that time. And the war ends. What's the mourning process? What's the process we go through to deal with what we've just gone through? And the answer is almost nothing. Uh, we, we just moved forward. Uh, and, and that's not so negative, but what it, what it allowed to happen was quite a deliberate effort that was made. There is, a, there is an account, for example, of uh, somebody in Washington, D.C., a department uh, articulating a very deliberate strategy, what I call Panem strategy, which comes from the Latin, uh, that, that, that means circus and bread. And that is, we're going to distract the masses. We're going to, going to keep this war economy going through television and, uh, and shopping. And this will be a really deliberate effort to, to, so, so that when people have this extra time that they've been promised they'll get from time-saving devices and so on, they will use it in one of two ways. And indeed, that is just what happened. And the two ways are watching television to be told how your life should look and then going and shopping to try and make your life look like that. So discretionary time was used up in those two ways. Uh, so instead of spending it with family or instead of trying to come to terms with what we've just gone through, uh, or instead of investing in the next phase of citizenship, we became consumers. Uh, and, and we threw out old uh, time-tested uh, routines and uh, you know weekly okay we're going to take a day off every week and and be with family and go, go to church and so on these things were just shredded under like a new, change of values new, almost like a shift of values could you say it was something like that yeah i mean i think that you know it's the question is always which comes first when you think about a shift of values um but you know was it 
but it definitely, I think it added up to that. You know, I think it added up to, it was a change in, in routine. It was a change in the system and the system informed behavior. And so in all practical terms, the values changed. But even where I think people weren't saying my values are different, their, their routinized values were changed. And, and that's, I think, how, routine, how values do change most quickly. It's not that people suddenly say, well, I think work is more important than family. It's not that people say that. It's not that they say, I think that, I think that shopping is more important than creating space to think and ponder and meditate and pray and so on. It's not like that at first. The behavior shifts and the behavior informs yourself as to, okay, well, I guess this is what I value. You know, this is how I should live now. Um, anyway, I'm going deeper than I meant to go, but, but this was for era two. And all of that sets us up for the era we all have experienced and are witness to, which is, um, which is the last 10 years where we've gone from being connected to hyper-connected. So it's like, it's like all these new technology firms, the, the, the latest wave of Silicon Valley companies, the social media companies, they didn't start the fire, but this has, been, this has you know, poured fuel on something that was already there a set of ways of thinking, ways of being, and so on. So all of this leads us to this time that we live in, this era in which you ask the question, why is it to so many people, this is the default position? Yes, it's default. This is the system. It has been built, architected, and then, of course, by default, other system systematic changes have taken place. So this is our inheritance. Now, let me just tie up this, apologies, mini lecture with, the, 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 the other framing, which is that originally I'm asking the question as you did, why is it that people are doing what they're doing? Why, do, why are people violating what's essential for what's non-essential? But now the question is a, a better question, I think, is why, um, why aren't some people going along with that system? It's actually easy to understand why people are doing what they're doing. If the systematic changes are as I just described them, and that's just a brief description of what's really happened, of course that's how people behave. People will act as the way that their system is built around them. Systems are incredibly powerful in shaping human behavior, even against our own values if the system is such. And so, of course, people behave that way. So now we have to say, why doesn't everybody? What is it about the few people who don't? What about the few essentialists who say, forget all that? Just because, just because the majority has been behaving, so I don't have to violate my values. I don't have to go along with it. I can, I can make my own choice. They, they, they say, and that's exactly what I see essentialism as now. It's like the study of and the, and the care of those people who are saying, I want to make a different choice. Whatever the system says around me, I want to make a different choice. And I just, I guess the, the thing that, you know, we are so impressionable and that is where we're seeing that we are following and being essentially following what we're being told. So how do we make the intentional decisions to be intentional and to kind of, how do, how do we almost block out the noise to really get clear on what is essential, what is our priorities without the external influence too much? Yeah, so I, I, there's two ways of approaching this, and I'm going to ask, ask you to answer how you want to approach it. Uh, one way we can answer it is I can just sort of tell you what I think and what I've learned. Um, and the other way is that we can do it, right? Like, one of you become the, the, the person wanting to become more of an essentialist, and I will take you through that journey. So which way do you want to approach it? I don't mind. It could be either way. Both, both work. Let's go through it. Okay. And who wants to be the person? Clara. Oh, oh okay. I was going to be like, Kylie. <laughs> we'll see. We see. We could even... We, Maybe you do both, but it depends how fast we are about it. Okay, so Claire it is. So, okay. Claire, <laughs> so Clara, I want you to, to I, so three stages. You know that you read the book multiple times, you just said so. Mm -hmm. 
three stages. What is essential? Is it essential, uh, so, excuse me, explore, eliminate and execute. Explore, eliminate, execute. These are the three stages. This is a pattern. So it's, uh, it, it's not like a, it's not just one, two, three, and you're done. It's an ongoing thing, as you mentioned, a disciplined pursuit. So exploring what is essential means figuring out, you know, what, what amidst all these things should I, you know, do I think is extremely important rather than just okay or good. And, and I want to apply that. So, so here's, here's what the question I want to ask you is, can you think of something right now in your life that is extremely important to you, but in reality is underinvested in? So on a scale of one to 100, it's like 90 and above in terms of importance to you but it might be invested in you know zero to ten percent on the investment side so you know it's important but you know you aren't investing as much as you'd like what comes to mind when i say that to you um it's funny but my like my physical health okay so physical health and so we're still staying on stage one because this is still under all the idea of what is essential to you. And, and so let me ask you this. Let me ask you, what does success look like to you on this? So if you were investing X, let's say per day, what would need to, what, what would that be like for you? Like to, to the point that you say, you know, it might not be perfect, but I'm no longer feeling I'm under investing in this area. This is, this is, this is good. I'm pleased with it. What would it look like? Give me in minutes and hours per day, something like that. Um, so if my physical health was what at the level that I think it should be, what would that look like? Yes. Um, yes. That would look like no digestive issues. Um, so, you know, waking up and feeling like good in my, in my GI system um, and feeling well rested you know, not kind of waking up and being like, oh, I wish I could sleep another hour. That would look like um, feeling energized to go out and move my body and exercise. So good energy levels throughout the day. Um, it would look, do you want me to do more? Is that good? <laughs> <laughs> it's a decent, it's a decent <laughs> amount right there. Okay, so, okay good. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's take that. Let's, let's just talk about what that would what change would really be required to do that? There's a lot of integrated things, and of course, health is integrated. Um, so, so it's well rested, it's energized. I mean, what, what's your sleep level right now? Um, I mean, it's pretty good. I, I travel a lot, so I'm always kind of like, I don't get like as consistent, you know, of sleep. So, how, um, how much are you traveling? At least once a week on a plane. Okay, um, and so you're sleeping on average how many hours a night? Do you actually know the answer? No. no. Your, your, <laughs> your honest best guess answer is what? Probably like seven, seven hours a night. And have you had a period before where you have been getting like eight hours and then you felt well rested? Yeah. Yes. So whatever the current level is, you know, sometimes when people say seven, if they actually get a Fitbit or something and they, find, they actually measure it, they find that it can be a lot less than they think they're getting, you know. So the reason they're not feeling energized or well-rested uh, is because, in fact, they're sleeping less than they think. But let's say that the delta is one more hour, right? That if you slept one hour extra per day, that you would feel well rested and energized. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, I think so. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that didn't see, you didn't seem very convincing to me just then. Well, what, what, what yeah. more than that for you? So well, go on then. What's I, I, think, I think seven, I think you're right. Like I think seven, maybe I'm in bed, but the quality of sleep, because I'm in different beds and you know, different sleep schedules, different time zones, that it's probably less. So the delta is probably two to three hours 
extra a night or like, you know, so quality. What, yeah. what you need is two to three hours. You, you, you need two to three hours more sleep, but it's probably one more hour of actually bed downtime. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, so, so there really is like a sleep issue here because, because you're describing, you're saying, look, even the hours that I'm down, I'm not really sleeping. It's, it, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not rested. Yes. Yeah, exactly. H have you gone through a process of like really figuring out sleep? Have you, you know, have you gone to like a, you know, to, to sleep clinic, for example, have you done any of those things? No, no. <laughs> because you assume come on man who who who, who why why not why haven't you um because i think i know never, what I never in your life did you think we were never in your life did you think <laughs> we were having this conversation yeah yeah uh nope i didn't think we would have this conversation um i i know what i need like i i know that it's just like i need more downtime i need more time at home i need to like travel less like I know all those things because I, I don't think it's like a physical issue. If I did have more downtime at home and slept more nights at home, then I would sleep better. I believe. So what, what do you think it is for you then? What, what's the actual change? What, what needs to be, what, what do you need more? I mean, I think we've identified more, more sleep, more sleep. That sounds right. It covers whether it's, whether it's I'm lying down and I'm not really sleeping. I mean, when you say that you need two to three more hours for those extra two hours, because I was saying one more hour, are you saying for those, like for those two hours, what's happening? Are you just kind of not resting well through those two hours? Or are you sort of waking up and doing things? Oh, I'm looking at my phone. Didn't work. What? <laughs> oh, I didn't know you meant that. This is, so this is bad. Yeah, I think all of our yeah, listeners, don't do what I do. Do as I say. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry though because so many of them already are don't worry you yeah. don't worry about being involved with this because it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's so many people doing this are you kidding me i did a I did a, a segment for, for the uh, steve harvey show i went to the get somebody from the audience went to their house and i was asking where they put their phone and she said yeah under my pillow under my oh. pillow she every time someone texts emails anything she picks up wakes up picks up her phone reads it, responds, goes back to bed. I mean, this, this, it's all right. You're, you're on a, you're in good company. Yeah. Until you're, in, you're like, I'm not, I don't have that. So I'm fine. Okay. So you're telling me that you're not getting seven hours sleep. You said seven hours sleep, but you're not. You're saying you get five hours sleep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the part of this is that, that when I'm traveling, I don't have a routine. When I'm at home, I don't have my phone in the bedroom. It's not in the bedroom. It's out by my desk. I plug it in at nine. I don't look at it until the morning. I do have really good habits at home where I have all of my things controlled and the, and the routine and my husband's there. So like, I don't want to have my phone in the bed, but when I'm at home, when I'm traveling and I'm you traveling so much, I'm like yes. distracting myself and I'm in different beds and I'm trying to, so. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I, to I totally understand this. I travel too and, and, and quite a bit. The, the only tiny thing distinction I want to make there from something you said, you said, I don't have a routine. And I know just what you meant when you said that. You meant I haven't chosen a, a deliberate routine myself. But you do have a routine. You just don't have the routine you have deliberately and thoughtfully selected. And so, you know, when you travel, you probably have quite a consistent routine of checking your phone, of being on the phone, of, of distracting yourself, because there's nobody there, it doesn't affect anybody else, it's easy to justify, it's sort of fun, at the, at the, you know, this is it. So you are making a trade-off right now, right? You're making a trade-off between your physical health, sleep, I'm writing these down so I have, have this here, and, and, and of course what you're, you're gaining is, 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 this, is this phone time, right? Uh, this is, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, this is a, a, a combination of being, um, you know, yes, you're checking email, you know, you're doing email stuff, which is sort of semi-productive, but you're also on your, you know, other app of choice, distraction app of, of apps of choice. 
which include Netflix. Uh, include Instagram. No, go on. Yeah. Instagram. Instagram is probably Instagram, Facebook. More than Netflix. More than Netflix, so for sure. Instagram. Um, what else? This this sort of extra two hours of of, of surfing and, and swiping and so on. What's in that two hours? Lots of texting too. I do get, and I was I actually just got this app Screen Time to start to like measure where I'm spending my time. Yeah. And texting is like huge. Huge. Amazing. Yeah. As soon as we as soon as we put texting on phones, right? We didn't use, we, we shouldn't call them phones anymore, right? We don't use them as phones. Yeah. We use them as text machines, which, which is actually a pretty low technology form, which means that we've done all this work to develop these like fancy devices, and now we use them for the lowest <laughs> data sharing experience between people that's possible, but it's easier. Okay. Yeah. Uh, easier than talking to okay, so texting and Instagram. All right, I've got, I think I've got the idea now. We're kind of jumping between the first two steps here, exploring and eliminating, because the elimination things are coming up to the surface already. But before I go formally into that step two, I still want to ask you one more question about this what's essential. I want you to tell me, why does it matter? Like, do you really want to make a change? This You said, you, you said we want to be well rested. You said you want to be energized. Do you really care about this issue? And if, first of all, answer that. Do you really care? No, don't pretend. You might not. You might go, oh, I can live with it. No, I live really do. I really do care. It. Yes. Why really do you care. care? Why do you care? Um, I think because it's really wrapped up in the work that I do. So, like, I am a life health coach. I help people really design their life. Like, ultimately, if you're to really zoom out and get the big picture, like, I I help people do that through my blogging, through this podcast, through, you know, my content. So it's it really credibility. feels, yeah, credibility, legitimacy feels really important. And then it, and then on a very personal level, it does feel really important that I'm healthy and, and, and can engage with life at the highest possible level. That's very important to me. Why, Why is it important to you? Um, like so Maybe, yeah. maybe it's fine. Maybe you just, maybe you just live with it. Maybe you just go down the path. I mean, until this point, until we outed you, nobody knows. <laughs> so don't, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. Life has gone on fine. Why does it really, you say it's important. Oh, yes, I need more energy. I'd like to live at the full. Does it, why does it matter to you? Go deeper for me. Mm. It, it does. It comes back to my purpose in the world. Um, and which is you, what, which is to empower women. Yeah. To emp empower myself and to empower women both. So, and that is like, I've, I've done a lot of work on this coaching, you could say. And when you distill down like my purpose, what do I feel most like the fire in my belly about it's empowering women, empower myself, empower the world is my, is my anchor. And Can so, you, mm -hmm. sorry, please. And, and so that's, that's why, like, that's why it matters because. So, mm -hmm. I just interrupted you again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So my question is, is can you achieve that noble purpose while also getting, let's call it five hours now of sleep? Can you do both? Um, well, I think, I mean, I, I think that the reason that I am doing it in the first place is because part of me believes that, you know, doing these kind of distracting things, doing all this travel is working towards that purpose too, right? So I, and I do believe in seasons. Like I do really believe that like there are seasons of our life where we have to kind of sacrifice some of these things to whatever kind of build build and then there's seasons where we kind of have to be a little bit more like recuperating time and i am in a season of building not recuperating right now you're saying i can be imbalanced for a period so i can be balanced for a period later it's like there, there are there are as you say phases and seasons in life so if you give a little more now and, and sacrifice a little more now that that may be justified over the longer run is that what you're saying yeah yeah 
So, so again, I come back to this question because if you, because it, it, it's jugular, it, if, if you can empower women and yourself without making this change, then we haven't found the right why yet. But if you find yourself saying, no, it, it's so, it's, it, it gets, if my current rest level gets in the way of me authentically, credibly, and, and actually being able to fulfill this mission, then I need to change so that I can fulfill the mission. And I'm curious about it in your view. Is it, does it, must it change to achieve your mission? No. <laughs> that's what that's I that's, that's, that's not like my like my mind saying it, but it's like my gut feeling. Is yeah. like no. Your gut feeling says I can actually achieve this mission. I can empower other people. I can do this work even if I keep getting five hours like I am right now. Mm -hmm. So now I want the real why. Or let's give this up. Let's let's not <laughs> pretend it matters. Uh -huh. <laughs> What's the real why to you? Do, does, it, does it really matter to you? I'm going to be well-rested and energized. I mean, everyone says that if physical health matters, well-rested matters. Why does it, what's the, what's the why for you? Does it matter to you? Um, I guess the next thing that comes up then is, um, is, you know, a value of, of family and of, of being like, present for my family because then then it feels like if if i'm if i don't have to do it for my purpose and i can still continue to my, do my purpose especially with this idea that i'm building now i can all recuperate later i'm making a sacrifice now for something later then presently why do i want more rest i guess it would be to be like better at home you know so that i'm not just feeling because it's almost like I can I can do one or the other when I have this amount of rest right where I want to do both I want to like have the purpose and I want to be present at home and I want to have those values of having um, a good relationship and all this stuff yeah something that you said that feels really true to me is in my own experience is that is that the professional work for me not speaking for you but I think we're on the same page is easier than yeah. the essential role of being a husband for me, a father. You know, I have four children, not very essentialist of me. <laughs> um, <laughs> the most essential thing. I mean, this, to me, this is really, really important, right? This is at my, certainly 90% and above. It's like the, the, the 99th, the 100%. This stuff is really jugular, really critical to me. It's much harder emotionally, physically, mentally, to be a great husband and a great dad than it is to go and speak at a conference, to, to, to answer email. These things can be done at a much lower uh, mental, emotional health level. But if you're dealing even with normal life in a marriage, normal life with children, um, that is so exhausting. I mean, to me, it's so much more important, but so much harder. And so if I'm exhausted, if I if I'm tired, oh, that's the then then I just don't have what it takes to do it well. I can do it badly, <laughs> you know. I can interact with everybody in a grumpy way, but uh, but but to be at my to be able to even do it at a really high level to be a to be a peak performer in those roles requires rest. Okay, so let me. You, you're nodding. You've had, that, that sounds yeah. right to you. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I just. No, can that's, relate to that's it. right. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's always easier for me to do professional work than to be, than to have the family, yeah, life on lockdown, for sure. Mm -hmm. So it's so it's interesting because when you're at home, you actually do better on the sleep process, right? Because the routine's there and you don't want to keep, you know, your husband up and so on. But actually the habits while traveling mean that when you're coming back into your, home life, your family life, you come back a more exhausted version of yourself than yeah. you'd like to be. That all sound right? Exactly. Okay. Okay. So, so 
the, 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 the one sort of additional question I have about this piece is just what does, you know, concretely, what does success look like? I, I think I'm going to put out there that it's seven hours of uninterrupted, no technology, um, you know, no, no technology, no email, no any of that when you travel. Full seven hours, so what? You're in a different bed. I mean, this, this is not the issue. The phone is the issue. The technology is the issue. I mean, the beds, I mean, if the beds are that bad, you just get to stay at different hotels, but I bet you're staying in per perfectly great hotels. That's not really the issue. There's no accountability. The system isn't built. The system's not built. And so I think that that, that, that seems to me to be the change that's, that, 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 you, that is required. Do you want to make that change? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. That has to be the right answer right now, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> Okay, and the trade-off. So now we're moving to step two, even though we won't spend very long on step two because we've already done most of the work here. Step two is what do you give up? So it's eliminating something that is non-essential. That is something that's zero to 10% important or not important, but is over-invested in. So you might be investing at the 90% level, but it's only a 10% important you know, item. Mm -hmm. You already identified Instagram. You identified texting. I mean, some texting is valuable. I understand that too, but not, not hours and hours. Nine. Not after not nine. Not after yes. nine. Come on. Yeah. My judgment <laughs> after nine is absurdly low. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly. My Honestly. Yeah. No. It, that's it is the only time I'm interested in watching Netflix or catching up on news from England, and I like news and I like uh, watching Prime Minister's questions, stuff of this sort of thing. It, it somehow after nine o'clock at night, that stuff seems, seems reasonably important. I guess I think that's really what I ought to be doing right now. <laughs> By the next morning, I look at the same things. They'll maybe still be open on my desktop. And I think that is just complete junk. There's no <laughs> need for one second on that. <laughs> and, 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 and I think those are relatively, you know, innocent activities. I think people can get pulled into real junk late at night. So, okay. So, so we've identified these, these things. Now what we need is the third step, which is a system, a routine, a system that is built to make the change you've just identified, the trade-off you've just identified, as effortless as possible. You see, what we don't want is a system that only works when you are highly motivated, highly disciplined, highly energized, in the morning, you know, when we've just had this conversation, that's, that system, any system can work under those environments because you're going to make it so. What we need is a system when you're traveling, tired, a bit burned out, no, one, no one's there, you don't really have any discipline left for the day. We still, the system needs to work then as well. So what can we do to build such a system? Well, first thing, um, you know, we need, we need a reward. Okay. Fun reward. Everyday reward. When you're traveling, every time you make this trade-off, that is every time you shut down all technology at nine o'clock and don't open any of it back up until you've slept fully seven hours, you get an instant reward. I don't know what it is. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't, but it's got to be concrete and Fun, just frivolous is fine. What, anything come to mind for you? Well, instant, so. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Doesn't have to be, but better if it's instant. Hmm. I don't know, yeah, nothing comes to mind that could be instant, you know. Like okay, I, what's not instant for you? What, what, what's fun that comes to mind for you? Um, like, like an hour in the morning. <laughs> like an hour in the morning to get coffee and like not not engage with my phone like that's it's funny because at night it's like you want to engage with the phone but in the morning I feel like I have to engage with the phone or the technology but I wish I didn't you want to break from it in the morning because in the morning you feel enough restored that you can perspective is restored you know that stuff's a complete waste of time this stuff really matters okay well maybe you could do that that can be built into your into your routine you mm -hmm. get one hour to go sit in a coffee shop with a book, mm -hmm. 
with your whatever drink of choice and relax there for one hour. Mm -hmm. You can that in most, most hotels have a place that you can go to do that. And if they don't, you know, it's not very far to be able to walk to a place or do something. So that's your reward. Good. We have a reward. Okay. Now we need the takeaway. This is where it gets, this is where it gets real. We need the like, every time you travel and you don't, every time it's, you check your phone after 9 p.m., you, you, you don't get full seven hours, what's the thing that you, you, you lose? Some concrete thing you lose. And it can't just be, oh, I don't get to go to the coffee shop. It's got to be something that's tangible. It can also be fun, it can be silly, but it's still real. Anything come to mind? I mean, I don't want to do anything that would be bad for me, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. I'm so curious about what you were thinking like, about just you then. have to well like I was gonna say like I don't I don't turn on like I have this little travel diffuser that I put essential oils in and it's like a whole it's part of a routine that I really enjoy mm -hmm. and I was just thought like right. oh I could like not do that because I enjoy it mm -hmm. and uh, well, that would be a huge problem I would finish myself from something healthy right yeah right. I was thinking I was imagining you like creating a personal fear factor or something yeah. where you're like <laughs> <laughs> I have to eat. I, have, I don't know. So, I have to eat some weird. Yeah, no. I, um, I, I have I have one suggestion, but it's not um, it's not by any means like my favorite thing that everybody should do. But I once I heard someone that did it, uh, I thought, yeah, that's a pretty good example at least. Yeah, of what a I'm good example about. would be good. Yeah. So so what what uh, what they decided to do um, is. So they figured out their daily thing, pretty much like we have, and they said, okay, for every, what they did is they took what I now call the $100 challenge. Uh. And they put a $100 bill on the wall, and any time they don't follow through on their commitment, trade-off, they, on that day, now they don't do it every day, they're not repeating this, but they just, because ideally they never have to do it, but if they fail to do it, they take the hundred dollar bill, they rip it up, they throw it oh. away. <laughs> yeah, that might that's work. awful. Right? Yeah, in my work. Yeah, right, because, because nobody wants that sort of waste, right? Nobody wants to take that perfectly good thing and just waste it. So maybe I do but, twenty though. Maybe I do 20. 20. <laughs> it's called the $100 challenge for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> you can't let you off that easily. <laughs> the, question, the question to ask you is, what's this worth to you? If you can yeah. magically, if you could snap your fingers and have this change happen so that you never check your phone and Instagram texting and so on after 9 p.m. at night when you travel and you always got seven hours of sleep from now on, What's that worth to you? Give me a dollar number of what that is worth to you. I mean, if millions. You millions pay... of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say at least a thousand. <laughs> I'm like mil a million, million. <laughs> a million dollars. That would be worth a million dollars to you. So, okay, so fine. So now back to the hundred dollar challenge. <laughs> mm -hmm. Are you ready to take the hundred dollar challenge? I'm ready. I'll do it. Yes. Mm -hmm. You're going to go to the bank. You're going to get a hundred dollars out, mm -hmm. iron it. Put, put it in it my up. wallet or something. Yeah. Put it in your wallet. Put it. As soon as you don't do it, you have to rip it up. Now it's shocking. I know when people hear it, it's shocking, but it's, it's only shocking because it, it makes it real. Now we can't just say, well, that's important. This is important. I'll make this trade up and I could do that. And we've got to make a decision. Now, here's a couple of other things that you can do to build the system. The system is, is, is the, the key really to essentialism is get clarity first, but then build the system to, to support it. Uh, accountability partner. Who do you talk to about all of this? Mm -hmm. Who can hold you accountable mm -hmm. even when you're traveling, they can check in with you. You know, they can check in with you at 10 to 9 and say, okay, this is it. This is, this is closing. This is the, 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 the end of times until you've got this going. 
I just call it the end of times. That's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> this is the end of times. You have to. Who could be this accountability partner for you? Who, who would who would do this for you? Mm, I think my husband would do it. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he might be incentivized to do it. Yeah, he's like, I don't want you ripping up hundred dollar bills. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> If you were, if, if you were to, um, there's many other things we could do to build a system. In the book, there's the whole final section. The book is about how to make execution as effortless as possible. Each chapter is taking a piece of the puzzle, and you can use all of those pieces if necessary and beyond. I mean, that's just a few suggestions in the book. You build a system, and the idea is that you get to the point where you say, you know what, the, the odds, this, the, this, this, I'm stacking the deck in my favor. You get to the point where you go, of course I'm doing this thing. And of course I won't do the other thing because the system's built now. Yeah. Uh, it's all reinforcing. It's not based upon my own willpower. I'm using my willpower to build the system so then the system acts upon me afterwards. That is exactly the idea. You use your willpower differently. Okay, so now just one more piece to this. You mentioned the accountability partner. You mentioned talking to your husband. Now let's suppose that you were to call your husband right now. Mm -hmm. and you were to explain to him what we just done. Mm -hmm. Could you just pretend that I'm your husband for a second? Well, that's weird, but <laughs> explain to me what just happened and get me to be involved. Okay. Um, so I just had this podcast recording with, Greg, and it did not go as I was planning, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I got a lot of information on myself. And one of the things I realized was that for me to be the best me at home, I have to put a little bit more, um, I have to create a system that incentivizes me to change some habits when I'm traveling. And one of those habits is to get more sleep when I'm traveling so that when I come home, I can be nicer to you. <laughs> um, right. I'm telling it to you. Right. Um, so one of the things I need to do is to find an accountability partner to make sure that I don't get on technology after 9 PM. And then I always get seven hours of sleep. Would you be willing to check in with me once in a while, not planned times to see how that's going when I'm gone? Okay. Yes. I would be willing to do that. Great. It was fantastic. Great job. <laughs> One, there's one little thing I want to just emphasize here for you, okay. but of course, everything we've just gone through is not really for you, excuse me. It's for everybody that is listening and watching, is that they, they, they're all dealing with their own trade-offs that need to be made. They're all dealing with what's essential, being, at the, uh, you know, uh, being overrun by some non-essentials in their life. So you, 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 it really is for everybody that you've gone through this process. Now, here's something that I want to emphasize for you and everybody, is when you explain to somebody, this is what's essential, this is the trade-off I want to make, this is how I need your help. The thing that everybody misses, and they miss it even though we just made, I don't know, probably almost 10 minutes of our process was emphasizing it and doing it. They never mention it when they come to actually involve the next person. It's yeah. like literally 90, no, hundred percent of the time I've done this with people, they never do it, which is just a curious factor to me. And the thing that's missing is why this matters to me. It's yeah. just not, in, you know, I mean, you mentioned, yes, you know, I, I was, I can be nicer to you. And I guess that was there, but, but, but deeper, what are you really saying? You saying, look, I realize that I have enough energy to do the work out there. And that's important to me. And I have a, a feeling, a mission about that. But that's a public mission out there. What is jugular to me, what matters to me immensely, and more even than all of that, for all that that matters is you and our family and being the best me here. And I really want to make a change because I can see that even though things are good, I want them to be great so that I can fulfill the the, the, this deep essential mission in my life. And so I'm asking you to help me because this matters so much to me. Mm -hmm. Yes. That speech in your own words, I'm just 
you know, saying something is what people miss most with essentialism. Sometimes when people read essentialism, what they get caught up in is a section, and it's in there about how to say no, how to eliminate. But it's almost like they, they think I wrote a book called Noism. Uh -huh. and, and the book is essentialism, and the difference makes all the difference. We've got to know what the yes is, and we have to communicate that yes, that why clearly. And we don't. I mean, literally, it's like the number one leadership mistake, self-leadership self mistake, is that we just don't. We take for granted that people know our intent. And not only don't they, they cannot. It's invisible. It's deeply private. And unless we disclose it, and not just once, but again and again, they cannot know it, will not know it, and therefore they will misjudge our behavior. Mm -hmm. So this particular piece of this, although in a sense it's a small piece, it's, it's like really important when you try to take essentialism from the private domain into the relationship domain. You've got to express the, the, the intent. This is why I want to do this. This is why I want to make this change. And go, being bold about it, being, being awkward about it, It'll feel awkward at first. It's not really that awkward, but you feel, oh, I'm putting this out there. Do I really need to say this? This feels a little strange. It's because we're not doing it, but that doesn't mean it's, it's really not strange. Everyone goes, oh, now I know why. Now I can help you with it. Now I can support you with it. That's the process. I know we did it a little differently than you expected to do, but that's <laughs> no. the process. No, I loved, I loved it. It's just, it's just funny. I was like, yeah, so, so this one is what... <laughs> These, I had all these questions I wanted to ask, but this is so much more practical for people. And I think they're just going to see this process and be able to know, you know, if they haven't read the book, it's going to be so much clearer when they do read the book and go through it. I, I think so too. What were some of the questions? And Kylie, I know I'm very conscious we spent a lot of time on that there, but, <laughs> but what, what, questions, what questions are missing here? You know, or what questions were there? Why don't you just, somebody just list them out so that we can like at least connect them back to what we just did. Yeah, totally. I think, um, I think a big one that I wanted to kind of, and definitely we can connect it to this, is like, what's the benefit? Like how, like how have people's lives changed from it? Um, and- Right, so, so yeah. let, let's answer that. Right? It's, it's actually making a trade off of something that is unimportant that gets invested in for something in, in, important that doesn't get invested in. That's essentialism. That's the value proposition. And, and it's doing that process again and again over time to the point that your life is full of what is really extremely extraordinary important and it's starved of the stuff that is just absolutely unimportant but has somehow crept into our life. That's the advantage. What a benefit to be free of all that rubbish and to instead be able to say, I've lived a life that matters. I am spending my life doing the things that really are valuable to me, that are key to me. Okay, good. What's the next question? Um, what, well, I guess the thing oh, yeah, that, go ahead, Kylie. I think, yeah, I think the thing that, you know, keeps coming up that I think is important and that people are probably, I can hear like the listener saying is like, well, my job comes first and that's why I'm traveling or that's why I'm doing this. And so job first, 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 but we answered that. And you just said it again was just doing that over and over and over going through that process over and over and being intentional because it's going to be so easy to revert back to, well, but my job is more important. So I can, I can miss out on the sleep, but I need to, I'm just using it as a, an example, but I need to text these people back because it's for my job and, you know, things like that. Yes. I mean, I, I think that, I think that again, the power of the existing system is immense. And so that, that system includes a current employer, includes, a, includes Apple, includes Facebook, includes Twitter, includes Instagram, it includes, you, you know, Netflix, it includes all of this is part of a system that is acting upon it. And I'm not actually, and I, I was keen to, to not do this in the book, and I was keen to do this, not to do this today. I have in no way said to you or to the reader, this is what you should value most. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is private and that is ongoing journey. 
so the, the but but what I find is that there is quite a deep instinct uh, uh, that's sort of gut level, conscience level, voice level of what things matter more than others. Mm -hmm. And so the problem isn't even clarity. It's just that it's just that the other system is acting on us louder, faster, in our face. And so as we're doing it, we feel at odds. There is something unnerving, uncomfortable about texting in the middle of the, you know, late at night, uh, being in social media when really you should be sleeping. There's a feeling of not being alive. At least that happens to me, and I think it happens to other people. And so what I'm encouraging people to do is, is look at them and be, not be compulsive, but conscious in the choices. I am choosing this. I'm going to choose to do this. Including if you say, oh, I'm going to watch this movie, fine. Watch the movie about it. Don't do it, don't do it compulsively without recognizing that you're doing it. Anyway, that's a, that's a thought on that. Yeah, I think it, it just comes back to being intentional with every choice and practicing being intentional. And I think as, you know, especially as women who listen to this podcast, it's very easy to want to from everybody and take care of all the things and not being intentional about saying what is essentially the most important that's right here right now and I, I would assume a lot is family and those types of things it's easy to want to take care of even like the school board and this and that and so being more intentional is a practice and we've talked about that before um, but it's difficult yes and, and and let me just let's just build on it just one moment let me just like let me be clear about something I mean the, the each of you and each of the women listening to this and watching this have so much essential value in and of yourselves that that i mean my own my own world view is that you know that that and, and nobody has to subscribe to this view i'm just sharing mine um but are literally daughters of God. I mean, that's who you are. So it is out, an, an outrageous thing for society to have created a norm where we, that, that women should not recognize that or treat themselves that way. You know, it's not just for family. It's like, this is, if, if, if I have some, if I have like, there's not many things I value very much stuff in my life, but if I have something that I want to last forever, I have a watch that my wife gave me when we were married and my son definitely wants that. I don't know he wants me to die early for, to get it, but I, I think it's like, it's on his mind to have that watch as I've told him he'll have it. Well, I want to protect that watch because it matters to me. I want it to last for a, a long time. It, 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 it's really precious, you know, far beyond the value of the watch itself. So, so for the women listening to this, it, it, as you fully realize and recognize, it's not some lip service, uh, uh, oh yes, I'm important, I deserve self-care, you know, as if that's sort of selfish. No, it's that precious. You're that precious. Therefore, you must create this, the time. That's just what an essentialist would do. You must protect that asset. Because, I mean, in comparison to my silly watch, it's, I mean, that's just a watch. But I have the watch right now has is, is gone back to the original like, um, uh, company to be renewed because we've been married just 18 years now. So it needs to be, you know, it needs to be renewed. It needs to survive for a long time. You do that because it matters. The same for looking after yourself because that's how precious you are. So that's why it has to be done in that order. And that's also why you feel weird if you, if you violate that, even in serving and sacrificing for others, there's something off about that. I know none of these things are easy. I know that sometimes you, sometimes you are sacrificing sleep, of course, to, for a child, for, for, some, for somebody. Of course, it's not easy. But to try and come back to the things that are essential and to try and keep the order right I, I, I'm hesitant to say this because it, it sounds so presumptuous, but I was just reading something David Brooks said, and here's a man talking about quoting a man. And he wasn't talking about women, but here's the, you know, I, I, I worry, please understand my, my intent about it. But he, he says, he quotes Thomas um, um, Aquinas, 
a great theologian and philosopher, who defined uh, sin like this. He said, sin is to get our loves in the wrong order. I never heard that before in my life. I thought that was really precious, really beautiful. To get our loves in the wrong order. That's when we start to just feel all out of whack. And so if, if, if actual value is known, if your value is known, if you really are of that infinite worth, then that has to be placed, you know, time and energy protecting you, protecting your ability to discern, protecting your ability to think and be wise. Of course, that includes sleep. Of course, it includes this, 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 you know, this way of living. It includes trying to get the patterns correct, the orders correct between the relationships that matter most and the ones that are passing. But it also includes making a contribution to people in the world. But to get the order right, it goes to the heart of this now. We went to a deeper place than I expected to, but also to the heart of what essentialism is and what my intent for it is too. Mm. You just like, I mean, you, you were meant to come on this podcast because that is right on. That is right on. Um, and, I love, and I love that definition of sin too. I've heard the definition, you know, that it's just, getting further away from yourself like that's mm -hmm. that definition too i love that it's like you know there's like this place of alignment i think is what we're talking about and so when you get out of alignment that's like a sin right it's not in the typical way we think of those things there was one other question that i did have that i would just and hopefully it can be quick but i think in the book you talk about the importance of escape um because I think there's a lot of in this momentum and motion sickness concept. So like when we're, our life is like has all this momentum for like going in a way that's out of alignment, there's all this momentum behind it to stop and try and get that clarity, that first step of just, wait, what is important to me? I've been kind of spinning my wheels and dizzy with all this momentum, with all this momentum, the importance of like, almost removing yourself completely because I think that's where a lot of people are, you know, they, they, they might need to just completely kind of step out of that, of that momentum. Yes. I, first of all, I, I think this is right. Um, let me just answer that in a, in a different way than I, than I, again, used to think about this, you know, the, the journey is ongoing for me and, one of the thoughts I have now about this, I used to think and still believe that, you know, if you maybe take a day every quarter and go have a personal quarterly offsite where you really just step out of your life and look at your life. And, and, and this, is a, this is a very low technology day. I know someone, for example, who has a second phone and it's one of these like really simple phones. All you can do is phone it. Uh, you know, there's like, there's no... There's, it's like credit card size in, 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 and the, there's like only two people in his life who even have the number. Uh, so his wife has the number, his assistant has the number, something like that. And, and so when he travels off for this day, they can reach him. If it's an emergency, they can reach him. But otherwise, he's just unplugged and he gets to think about his life. And I, I still think that's really valuable um, and would encourage it. You know, people to put it on their calendars now, every 90 days to take this day, put it on a recurring thing and, and protect it. If that's overwhelming, or in addition to it, uh, I think an even easier place to start is, um, is really just the next moment. Uh, you know, a lot has been written about the power of being present, and I, and I subscribe to it. There's a chapter in Essentialism on it. Uh, but really, there's some new research that's been done about how long now is. Um, and, and it turns out to just be, you know, like, according to psychologists and neuroscientists, it turns out to be like two and a half seconds. Is how long it is. That's it. That two and a half seconds is the whole of life. It is, it is, so... 
the positive thing I'm saying, I don't want to overwhelm people. Sometimes you think about now, you think, okay, I've got to be present all the time. Okay, that's quite overwhelming. But, but I just think sometimes the getting out of the motion sickness so that you can just get centered is just literally becoming aware of your surroundings, pausing, and, uh, and breathing, and noticing, seeing, you know, noticing the person you're talking to. Just, you know, being distracted is so easy, isn't it, right? All it takes is pick up the phone, in two and a half seconds, I can be distracted. Pick up the phone, swipe, go to the next page, click on a link. It's all two and a half seconds. You can be distracted. That's the bad news. But the good news is, in the next two and a half seconds, I can, I can become focused again. I can be still again. In two and a half seconds, I can look up. Two and a half seconds, I can look at someone in the eyes. In two and a half seconds, I can take a deep breath, close my eyes. I know someone who does that. They, every time they sit down at, the, at their desk, they take three deep breaths. That's it. That was their beginning to meditation. Just three deep breaths to be here. And two and a half seconds, I can look up and smile. Two and a half seconds, I can say, I'm sorry. Two and a half seconds, I can say, let's start again. I can say, I love you. You know, these tiny increments. And so sometimes I, now I understand it better that it's less about this, how much time you take out. It's, it's this time, this moment. And just being in it. And of course, we won't be in it all the time. Of course, we won't. But as soon as we remember that we're out, it's almost like that's, that is the beginning of essentialism. We go, oh, I'm not in essentialism right now. I'm just feeling crazy. That's the beginning. And you go, okay, then I'll be present for the next two and a half seconds. And then, then, you're, then you're as good as anybody else, as, doing as well as anyone could be doing, doing as well as you could be doing. Because right now, you get to be here. You pause and you say, okay, what's the most important thing for me to do next? And that's it. That is what happens next matters most. I just got so many chills during that. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's so right. It's, it's like we can, because that is something that has really helped me from the book is like those 90 day check-ins. I call them like CEO day. It's like the CEO day, like CEO of my company. I need to go and like remember yeah. what I'm doing. And, um, right. but, but, but real life is just coming into the present moment we have all of our powers right here you know the wind on our cheek the breath in our lungs the the temperature of the room the smells that are coming around like that is power right there and that's where we get to decide you know each moment is a chance to start again they say that's like a quote but <clears throat> so true so true oh well thank you so like much Greg. Yeah. It's been my pleasure. <laughs> this was this was amazing. It was such an honor. Thank you, Clara. Thank you, Greg. Kylie. It's been my pleasure.